Hello and welcome back. I'm here with John from PD Questions. Do check out his YouTube channel. Um, and we are going to talk about NPD, Cluster B, relationships and recovery. So, John, do you want to say why you started your YouTube channel and what what's important to you to get across about having a Cluster B diagnosis, being diagnosed with NPD? and the <laughs> many years of wisdom that you have acquired okay well nice to nice to be talking to you dr ruth and um well basically um it's i guess i have mixed feelings about my channel because you know a part of me wants to stay very private um but i have been inspired by other people um who are much younger than i am um who who show just a lot more insight than what i had when i was younger um, I'm talking specifically about Jake and uh, Nameless Narcissist. He, he really inspired me. Um, I think he's very, very smart, um, probably exceptionally smart, dangerously smart. And um, I don't know, I guess I just, I saw something, you know, just the, the courage of just putting his situation out there. And I thought to myself, you know, I've had such a, um, such a difficult recovery, such a very, I think, unnecessarily long recovery, a lot of difficulty with therapy and um i was also really inspired by uh, um spirit narc who's a, a young person about jake's age really young and mm -hmm. really smart too and really talented and i think you know just the courage of seeing these young people and the fact that they really want to apparently really want to get better they want to they want to be self-aware they want to not just not just have the disorder but try to at least struggle you know at least struggle and 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 ask questions about it, you know? So I guess, I guess, um, I just felt motivated to, um, you know, I guess inspired maybe to, to share some of my own experiences, um, since I have had a difficult recovery and also some of my honest questions, honest questions about maybe sort of the, um, kind of the orthodox, sort of the orthodoxies that we have around personality disorders that I think might be a little bit too categorical might be a little bit too cartoonish um, and just sort of to try to promote questions towards maybe a little more realism, a little more fidelity and realism, kind of like the, the analogy between, let's say, you know, primitive painting versus like, say, you know, like fine art, you know, getting, getting towards a little bit more realism, more nuance. Um, and, um, and for me, I guess the most important thing is that um, I have gotten to a point where to me, like the, just the diagnostic criteria, just the description of the disorders, I find that to me, that's almost very, very different. It's very, very different from how I experience the underlying psychology of the disorder. And so I'm, I'm very interested in trying to stress how you, it's just like driving a car. You may end up with your car pulling to the left. Okay. But if your car pulls to the left, there could be many reasons why it pulls to the left. Okay. And just by taking the steering wheel and just correcting it to make it drive straight, you may still drive, you may drive straight by fighting what the car wants to do, but that doesn't mean you're fixing the suspension problem or the problem you might be having with the tire or the oil or the air pressure or whatever. And so I, I focus more on how I feel is like the analogy to the problem with the suspension or the tire pressure or the the alignment let's say yeah. and so i i tend yeah i mean i tend to you know not try to fight the steering so much and look down underneath and see what's really happening and so you know i've thought a lot about it and um that's where the pd questions you know questioning what, what is this stuff about the pd you know and so yeah that's pretty much the motivation and uh the bottom line is uh you know just offering my experience um uh, and, and honest questions, you know, um, just so that everybody who's in this predicament, and I think of it as just the cluster B experience in general, not just the NPD, that to me is not very far away from people who struggle with addictions or, 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 or just say, maybe you're not diagnosed with anything or not even diagnosable, but you, you sort of, sort of come from a family background where there's a lot of emotional immaturity um, and you're not far away from, let's say the world of addictions and, and just, you know, call it the world of immaturity, because I think it's a big world. And I think a lot of us um, can, you know, can gain a lot from, you know, accepting that and, and dealing with it. I, I agree. I think all of these things exist on a spectrum. So, you know, people with narcissistic personality disorder 
often also meet criteria for borderline personality disorder or avoidant personality disorder, or at the very least have some traits suffered. And any of us who could meet some criteria for some of the disorders, at least some of the time. So it's kind of like, I, I do see it as a, as a big spectrum, actually. And you can be struggling on a big level to the point that you would get a diagnosis and you can be struggling on, you could still be struggling and it's a more moderate level, but you, you know, it's still a lot of pain. And there's a lot that you can learn. And there's a lot, I think, that you can learn from each other. And I, I, I always think, Diag I'm, I'm concerned a lot about how we use diagnoses, particularly when it comes to starting to label other people outside of a kind of formal diagnostic assessment. I, I get really concerned about how do we use the diagnosis? What, what are we taking it to mean? Because yeah. to me, it's useful insofar as it may help direct treatment. So if I meet yes. someone who's very grandiose, for example, it's kind yes. of, take kind of one quite narrow point if i meet somebody who's grandiose i want to know are they grandiose because they're someone with bipolar disorder and they're in a manic stage nice. are they grandiose because they're psychotic and having a psychotic episode because both of those people i'm going to want to see a psychiatrist and i'm going to want to think very seriously about medication or is there a kind of grandiose fantasy that is much more in keeping with something like npd Yes, yes, I, I can see that. I can see that. And and also, like you say, it's, you know, I think that's the tool. That's what it's useful for. When it comes to understanding someone, I think you need to understand the nuances, that person's experience, that person's context, that person's culture, their interpersonal relationships in the past and now, and kind of what's going on for them. And I don't think that can be reduced down to here is a category. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I can just testify, and this is testimony firsthand that, you know, I never had any improvement with my, let's say my NPD diagnosis, and I was diagnosed twice with NPD. I never had any improvement, let's say with my NPD symptoms, okay, but any improvement that I did have came from dealing with, let's say the underlying psychology, okay, sort of what's underneath the symptoms, okay, and, and there has been a lot of improvement, but so in, in other words, it, it may have been useful for me to know that my, my symptoms were, let's say, in the cluster B neighborhood, okay? It was very useful to, let's say, rule out bipolar disorder, okay? Even though I did have manic periods, but I think those manic periods were in periods where I was decompensated, okay? So you have to get to the root cause, okay? And just because you have decompensated issues, it might even get on the border, the verge of, I, I had delusions. I had um, almost psychosis. I had a lot of psychiatric symptoms, but that you have to be careful because that was in the decompensated state. Okay. And so the, the fundamental issues, you know, I came, I guess I came to realize was more in the cluster B area, you know, having to do with the, the personality. And so at least it was useful um, to rule out things, you know what I mean? And so where the NPD diagnosis was useful for me was, okay, I've landed in the cluster B family. Okay. And that's my neighborhood. That's what I have to deal with, you know, and sort of rule out other things, you know, but that it took a long time because I think even the doctors I had were not really so sure, you know, I did also have some bipolar diagnoses along the way. So, you know, it was, it was confusing for everybody. Yeah. And these things are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. You know, I mean, NPD is highly comorbid with other disorders, the depression, anxiety disorders, substance abuse disorders. And sometimes I think you have to treat those other disorders first in fact always i'm in favor of treating the other disorders yeah. first because then you see what's what you're left with yeah you know well, i can i can tell you from my own experience when i had decompensated narcissism because i had a, a complete career failure okay i had I actually had two career failures i started off in aviation okay and i i lost that career at a very young age really due to my personality issues okay and that was very shameful but then i, I got invested in another career which is legal and I, I had a complete failure of my career as a lawyer. And after having two career failures at, at age 40, when I had you know, child support obligations and I had my student loan obligations, and I, I, I was seeing myself as a complete failure. And I was even starting to have trouble getting like menial jobs. Like when I tried to, let's say, get a menial job, the income I made wouldn't even pay my student loan payment. You know what I mean? So I, I was encountering, like, say, a complete, like a life failure, you know? 
And I entered into such a breakdown, um, you know, that the decompens the decompensated the decompensation psychology, you know, where it was it was to the point of almost uh almost psychosis. I was having delusions. I really had honest to goodness delusions. Um I was I was manic, I was just I was just completely the egg was broken, you know. And I can say that, you know, even though I, I finally chose not to take the medication, I, I did choose that because I, I felt like it did more harm than good. But the but take to so let's say taking the natural methods I took, you know, to to sort of slowly get better, I can honestly say it took about seven years in total to really evaporate like the the like 80% of the delusions and just kind of bring down that hypomania that I had where even today, I think I'm susceptible to very low grade hypomania just because I think it's my temperament. But, uh, but I can say that I'm, I'm a lot better now, but it took a long time, you know, and I guess I, I came to, to respect the brain, the, the neurology, you know, when the neurology gets out of whack, it takes a long time to take out the, that reverberation and get the mind back into a calm kind of a gentle state, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not a snap of the fingers and it may not be six months. It may take a lot of time, you know, to, to recondition the mind, you know? So I, I you talk about recovery. Do you think of yourself as having recovered from NPD? Well, not, not really. I, th okay. Here's what I think. I, I have stopped thinking a lot about NPD, I guess, because like I said, NPD is, is a steering wheel wants to pull to the left. You know, you got the arrogance, you got the, the envy, you got looking down on people, you got putting people down, you got being rude, you got using people. Okay, yeah, I, I get the cluster. But okay, so my steering wheel was pulling to the left. But at some point, I started realizing that I wasn't going to get anywhere just jerking the steering wheel back and trying to force the car to go straight. I had to get into the suspension and the alignment. And so... I've kind of lost interest, I guess, in the NPD because I realized that's not the answer for, how would I say, that was the answer for maybe sort of understanding what neighborhood I was in. But but to really get better, I had to get down into the guts of the car. And I sort of decided, I guess, that I, I guess I realized that if I was really going to even get better with those symptoms, I had to fix the underlying uh, mechanics, I guess. And so... You know, now it wasn't like I just had a uh, an inspiration and an illumination. It was through trial and error, but I, I found that that a lot of the um, those symptoms, the arrogance, the I don't know, just the disregard for other people, all that, that was really following from some basic issues that I had in basically my relationship with my environment in general. I, I realized that it wasn't specifically, even though it comes across interpersonally that the actual psychological hangups had to do with my interface with my basic environment. Okay. And what I discovered was that the, the fundamental sort of dynamics that was kind of hanging me up had to do with almost like a psychological state of welcome. And, and, and it's funny because we use the word avoidance very easily. Avoidance is almost like the fast food jargon, you know, but we don't really think about what it means not to be avoidant. Okay. And I think not, not being avoidant is almost like a neutral term. Okay. But we also forget there's like another gradation, which is on that same spectrum, which is the level of welcome. And I guess I kind of slowly discovered that there's two factors it's welcome and engagement. Okay. So if I have my general environment, not just interpersonal, but also just my environment, an environment is not just what's around me physically. It's also the intangibles. Like say, if I have a way of thinking and I have like a limited way of thinking, my environment also includes other ways of thinking that I'm not taking into account. So it's also in the abstract. The environment is a whole field of possibilities of material and tangible things and also intangible things like different ways of thinking, different points of view um considerations you know and so when you think of your whole environment as a field of uh, abstract and tangible intangible tangible uh, just what is around you your circumstances in life i realized that there were two factors in my interface and in interaction with the world which were basically the level not of avoidance or non-avoidance but the level of actually welcoming and taking on okay taking on the the subject matter of my environment okay and also the level of welcome you know so it's like um 
do you welcome it? Because you can take things on, but if it's just an unwelcome burden, that's going to totally infect one's attitude. Okay. And so I realized that even if I were to take things on, I had to check myself, am I really welcoming this burden? You know, and I realized there was a whole, there was almost like a whole universe of issues that I had not attended to as a young person. Okay. Because it wasn't in my family's vocabulary to even talk that way. You know what I mean? I don't come from a background where we even think that way, you know? What were the things that you needed to welcome? Well, I guess I had never been presented as a young person with the wisdom, the wisdom that there is a long-term benefit in assuming the burdens of one's environmental taxation, okay? That basically all of the data and considerations and subject matter that's in one's environment, if it's really taken on, it is a taxation, okay? It really is a burden. It, it burdens you just in processing, just having to process extra things. It's tedious, you know? And just the tedium and the extra, I guess, processing workload and even the emotional workload, the emotional burden of just, just all the taxation that's inherent in one's environment, that there is sort of a, um, a way you can welcome, let's say, the tedium and discomfort of it, knowing that in the long term, you're becoming more integrated and you're actually dealing with your life circumstance, okay? So that it's a very simple concept that you take on a certain amount of discomfort, you welcome it because you know in the long run, there's more, there's more, um, I, I would just say there's more beneficial processing, mm -hmm. <laughs> if, you, if you want to say that, you know? Yeah. I'm trying to think about how to maybe make this a little more concrete. Yeah. And I'm thinking about, I think all of the class to be, but particularly the more narcissistic end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. there is a real challenge in tolerating frustration. Oh yeah. Tolerating things aren't coming to me. Yeah. I've done this and I'm not at the top already. I get it. And the kind of frustration, the irritation, right. the boredom. Um, right. and, and actually, I think you're right. Those are not easy experiences for anybody, but I think there's a real need to like, I welcome this. I welcome the experience yeah. of not knowing what I'm doing, or I welcome the experience of being at the bottom in my yeah. workplace. Yeah. Because that will, those are the things that will help me learn. Those are the things that will help me grow. Those are the things that will give me new yes. experiences. And yes. I think there is a real need to learn that kind of frustration tolerance for, for yeah. everyone, actually. And also, this is where I firmly believe, and I'm a, I've become a believer that everything in psychology is much less intellectual as it is Anal an, an analogous to sports. Okay. I find that the, the realm of the emotional self, okay. If anything, I take maybe more inspiration from actors because actors use, use their whole body. And I think, I think actors might even think of themselves, you know, my body is my vehicle. It's almost like an athlete, you know, and in the sense that I have come to believe that even if you can intellectually understand, which a lot of people do, a lot of plus to be people understand intellectually, most people that, you know, if you, if you take on a burden and if you sort of work through it, you're actually generating sort of um, you're generating synthesis. You're, de you're generating advancement in the world. You're generating sort of a, you're, you're taking irreconcilables and you're joining them and, and you sort of working them together. You know what I mean? So like you're, you're, you're sort of um, how would I say you're, you know, like they say in the, the prayer of St. Francis, you know, where there's discord, there can be union. You know, I think that's a that's a phrase that we all understand, you know, like where, where how many discordant realities are there and, and how, ma how many times do people actually join them and fuse them and synthesize them together? You know, so that that process. So I think we all know intellectually that if if you if you take on the burden of things that are uncomfortable that are that are dissonant that are that are problematic and you work through them you can you can sort of build bridges everywhere you can sort of uh you can sort of mend mend uh you can mend tears you know what i mean you can you can fix things you can you can make things more integrated you know and so like we all understand that intellectually but i think if we don't have the conditioning to do that because it's a sport it's more than a sport it, it is a life 
grueling. Uh, if you don't have the marathon, the marathon conditioning, then it's just an idea. It will. There's no way to implement. In other words, I could say, well, I, I'm going to go walk 16 miles. Well, if you're not conditioned, go for it. You're not going to make 16 miles, <laughs> or or you'll you'll do it and your knees will hurt, or your legs you'll end up with problems with your joints. You know, you have to. You can't just walk 16 miles. You can't just do anything. And so I think that you know psychologically. Um, we talk a lot about removing pathology, but I don't know that we talk enough about conditioning people for the actual, the actual enterprise of actually living the, the life of someone who has to really perform, you know, in the sense that the body, it's almost like, okay, let's, we can, if you have if you, like sports medicine, if you have a, 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 an athlete who has a problem with their knee, oh, the first problem, let, let's get the inflammation down. But then the next thing is you got to get him back into the training with the physical therapist to get him back up to that high level of performance. So it's kind of like, I think a lot of psychology is sort of like, okay, well, let's get the inflammation out. Okay. Take away the pathology, but then you also have to go to the next step, which is get to that physical therapy to get him back into performance level. You know? So I think maybe we ought to think of three levels of, of conditioning, which is the, the degraded pathological level, the, the neutral, I've removed the, the pathology and then the conditioning level, you know, which is the, because th the actual living of life, I think is actually kind of almost like a high level. And I, I don't say that in the, in the, in the way of narcissists, like, oh, we, yeah. I try to create a vision of people as being like these, these like, uh, kind of like bigger than life, you know, like superior people. Yeah. It, but, but this is where but, I think the kind of the diagnostic concepts aren't sufficient. I mean, they give you, I, I like your analogy, they give you the neighborhood, right? But yeah. I, I think recovery, if, if that's even the right word, I tend to think more about growth. Okay. You know, because recovery kind of implies that there was health to begin with. Okay, okay. No, no, I, I'm, on, I'm on board with that. Personality yeah. disorders, there isn't, you're not recovering to a, a previous yeah. state. You're, I you're wanting to build the analogy I often use is that it's the difference between like if you treat someone with PTSD. Okay. Um, it's like yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they've had a train that's on the tracks and it's got derailed. The tracks are there. You just want to put the train back on the tracks. Yes. Not yeah, an yeah. easy task, but the tracks are there. Yes. Whereas when with the kind of personality disorder presentations the tracks are not yeah. there to begin with yeah the tracks yeah. are seriously screwed up you've got to start yeah. you've got to, you've got a lot of building to do and i oft i really see recovery healing i don't know what the right word would be but yeah, 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 that yeah. process is one of growth and development it, growth and development yeah development. growth and development yeah. and it's like yeah. sometimes you got to work on the train sometimes you got to build the tracks and i think you're right it comes in stages yeah and yeah it's it's not linear and it can't be predicted and it's it's human and it's yeah. you know you can't prescribe it uh, and interestingly of all the people marsha linehan who developed dialectical behavior therapy would took that view okay. her view was that the dbt skills that she developed should be the first stage of therapy okay and then people should work on their trauma and then they should work on building a life worth living and then they should oh. work on spiritual actualization well you know it, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to me just from my experience yeah. you know and i can almost i can i can say for sure like um you know how can i say this um i, I just I, I would prepare so like uh, with all due respect like people are free to disagree but i mean if somebody was open to this i mean I, I would possibly suggest to somebody who's who who knows that they're struggling with cluster B, you know, that that you may have this fantasy like, oh, I was this perfect child, and then something happened, and then I became this fallen person, you know. And also just to suggest that maybe at such a young age, maybe there never was an opportunity to to reach levels that that you could you could reach. So it's not like you're recovering something like a like a lost um, I, idyllic notion of what I was before, b before I was injured, but that I've never had an opportunity to fully actualize, you know, in what we mean by being a person. And that the idea of getting better is, is not just removing, let's say the pathology, but actually emerging to then actually actualize as a person and be more than just a person who doesn't have negative symptoms. You know what I mean? And so that, um, you know, that I guess in a sense, um, 
I don't know, like how would, I don't know how I would, how I would convince someone of that, but I would just say that if, if, if someone is, I think the way we we've defined these illnesses, it's almost like if you just take away the pathology, you're almost left with the ideal of a neutral person who's, who, who doesn't have pathology, but they're not really, they're not really actualized all either. You know, it's just sort of, I think somehow I, I, I'm concerned that we ought to really think about maybe um, modifying the definition so that, you know, really, really not being narcissistic may actually require, you know, getting, yeah, getting rid of maybe the, some of the worst symptoms, but also taking the extra step to maybe be sort of like, I don't want to say extraordinarily, but I, but I, I think for a narcissist, it, it, it would almost mean extraordinary in, in, not in the sick way, but in the sense that we might not expect how much to be human requires us to almost take on an extraordinary level of sort of a commitment to maybe much more environmental taxation than what we might expect. And then also much more conditioning than what we might expect. So that if we go into therapy with the idea that, well, I'm just going to remove these, these, these blemishes, you know, what, what it really may turn into is I'm going to have to, you know, and welcome it, but maybe take on the, the, take on the challenge of becoming what, what I never expected of myself in terms of conditioning, you know, and, and really, um, you know, maybe actualizing to much greater degree than what one expected, you know, and that's, that's the other thing I see with, with the personality disorders in my experience, because I never had in the vocabulary of my family, I never had this idea of, of, you know, welcoming discomfort, welcoming the taxations of the environment. And then the idea that this is for the benefit, this is going to produce benefit. This is, this is taking on pain, but for the, for the purpose of ben benefit, you know, getting things being better all around me and for me, you know, I never had that, that mechanism. I never had that slogan or that, that formula. It was, it, it was, it was not a theme in my family. So in a sense that all of that, um, but, well, basically, I grew up unable to form an expectation of what it would require to be a, uh, let's say, a healthy person. I, I had no idea of, I had no level, I had no grounds for expectation. And so I think it, it'll surprise a lot of people. It'll be like, God, that's, that's, that's almost like, you're not really suggesting therapy. You're almost suggesting like too much challenge. I think I want to go to a therapist who just wants me to get better. You know what I mean? So yeah, I think you can't, you can't only recover in therapy you know, I mean, therapy might be part of the, the journey for some people, but you've also got to acclimatize in a way to a new environment. It's a bit like being an expat. You know, you've come from one neighborhood. Do you want to move to a new one? Do that's you want a, that's to have that's quality of relationships that you've not had before? Yeah. Do yeah. you want to experience meaningful things in life that you haven't experienced before because yeah. if you do there may be a lot of learning to do and there may be a need to yeah. leave behind old habits you might it's like learning a new language learning a new culture oh, yeah. there's new customs there's new ways of being and you know that's really true you know i work a lot with people who are narcissistic i also work with people who have been in relationships with highly narcissistic people or who were repeatedly in those kinds of relationships. And it's it's similar in a way in that you have a certain kind of conditioning. You have oh, yeah. a certain way of seeing the world and being in the world and seeing yourself and being in your relationships. If you want to change that, it's like moving to a new country. Yeah, well, that's that's that's, that's a familiar. That's that's a real challenge. And I'll just say my first impression when I hear that. This will not just affect people with NPD. This will affect anybody who has, let me, let me just say this. I, you know, I have come to see myself not, I'm, I think less of myself as a person with NPD. I think, I think of myself fundamentally as a person who grew up in a very immature emotional environment. Okay. And I think we all know that all of us who identify with like, say, coming from an immature emotional environment, I think. We are not we are not just people with MPD. Some of us are people that don't have MPD, but but we do have that mm -hmm. that identification that we come from, let's say, an environment that that is our home. It's like our home identification. We identify with with a with a world that is kind of emotionally immature. Okay, and that's our home location. And even if we're aware that it's emotionally immature, we're attached to it because we feel that's our home. You know, and so I think that may explain why a lot of people who don't have MPD 
who do not have MPD sometimes end up attached to people with MPD because they may not have the same, let's say, expression of their, of their immaturity. But down deep, the immaturity is at least comes from the same home space. It comes from the same kind of kind of background, you know. And so I think that um, what you're suggesting, you know, about let's say that kind of emancipation, I think that will affect also some people who don't have an MPD but who have sure. kind of sim similar similar issues. And and maybe even by you know just by just by um, by happenstance or or you know just just by um, just by chance, you know, some of those people might be in relationships with people with MPD or, or people that have issues similar to MPD. But that um, I think this is maybe a question that a lot of us can ask. And, and now I'm not talking really to the just the NPDs out there, but just anybody who comes from a background where they, they identify deeply with an environment that has emotional immaturity, you know, that 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 challenge to sort of unstick yourself and just to sort of separate yourself. I would not underestimate that, that I think uh, human beings, we have a very deep attachment to our home identity and our home location. And even, even those of us who say, well, I don't really have an identity, you might be surprised, even though you don't have, like, say, you don't think you have an identity, deeply, you might be identified with, with a level of maturity, a level of emotional immaturity that feels like home to, to one. And that the... Sir, I think these are also human issues that all of us come from particular environments and even if it wasn't especially immature there's always other ways of being and yeah. you know anyone who gets into a close relationship with someone else and it's heightened if you come from different cultures yeah there will be differences and that doesn't mean someone's right or wrong but you that there's an expansion required if you yeah. want to engage more with the world and you want to engage more with other people, yeah. I think it is much, much heightened for someone yeah. in the cluster B spectrum. Yes. Well, the only thing I would suggest is that not to underestimate that there may be a lot of deep emotional barriers to, to true emancipation. There may be a lot of pseudo emancipations because I think the, the very, the very deep emancipation one will inevitably have to deal with maybe some very, very primal sort of aversions to being unstuck from what you feel is your home. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate that. And I think a lot of people um, might, might believe that they're emancipated in, in, but maybe at a very deep level, it, that's, that's actually very, very difficult. That's very difficult well, to do. If you've grown up in an environment where there's a lot of chaos, where there's abuse, where there's physical violence, where there's serious emotional manipulation and emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. There's a unfamiliarity in an environment that's characterized by physical safety, mutual respect, compassion, mm -hmm. kindness. That's unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah. am I al allowed to be here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, well also, you, find it, yeah. You, you find this in lots of ways as well, like someone who's grown up in in an environment where perhaps they haven't had a lot of money, where they've there's been some poverty, even if it's been a warm, nurturing environment. If you take that person and I don't know, they do very well for themselves and they find themselves in a very socioeconomically comfortable privileged circumstances they can feel really uncomfortable around wealthy yeah. people yes yeah. it's not psycho it's not to do with anyone being psychologically unhealthy it's just yeah. a change of culture that's that right you need to adjust to and yeah. i think with cluster b it's it's that but it's it's turbocharged absolutely and also like i i do think that we have to be careful because i think sometimes We'll say about somebody like say I grew up in a cluster B environment as well, and and there were there were poverty issues in my family, not so much in terms of money, but believe me, psychologically, when I saw my family, when I felt my family, I felt my family, and I could see I, I call it immaturities, but you know the way we would lose our temper, the way we would be rude, the way we would just just um, belch out comments and and hostilities coming out of our mouths and obscenities and. I could, I could sense that compared to other people, it was like, even if we might've had the same amount of money, 
I felt like there was something impoverished in our world compared to others. So I, I felt the poverty, even though it wasn't measurable in dollars, you know, also even the way my mother would spend money or, or like the way my parents would, it was almost like we had less money <laughs> in a sense, you know, just because just the, the level of responsibility. So, so I can say that um, I felt that sense of poverty, but I also want to be careful because a lot of times we'll say, and unfairly, I think we'll say, well, look at this environment. He grew up in a place where there was abuse and there was, uh, there was drugs and there was, um, you know, how would you say like, like toxicity, blah, blah, blah. But you forget, there are also some other things that go with those, those um, environments that is not all just, how would you say, just like, um, just ugly stuff. In other words, anybody like me, who's grown up in, let's say that kind of impoverished environment, there were also some kind of comforts and sort of like endearments that were part of that environment as well. Because even though my father could really lose his temper, my father could also be at times almost because of that. He could be very, um, at times, I mean, yeah, very rude. He could be very abusive, but at times he could be so frank that it was almost like a, a level of candor and a level of realness that often I don't find in people who are more, let's say, let's say more um, developed because there is, it, they almost come across as being so careful about what they say. They almost seem a little bit artificial. And for people who are, let's say a little more, I don't know, let's say more developed, more uh, advanced emotionally. Sometimes they're so careful about the feelings of others and how they say things that they're, they're, there's so much energy spent in the formulation of the I say the most um, diplomatic way to say something or whatever that, that you create a little bit of artificiality, you know what I mean? And occasionally there is something very endearing about people who, yeah, on the one hand, they can be very abusive, but sometimes they can just tell it like it is. And it's sweet. There's something sweet about that, you know? And so there, there are as many endearments in the home, in the home tradition as there are maybe let's like, say, you know, problems and toxicity. So I think it's really important, you know, if somebody's going to encounter that 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 process of considering an emancipation, you know, there there is a sense that you're not just leaving behind a bunch of toxicities, but you're also leaving behind a lot of endearment and a lot of very very deep endearment. So I think it, it's a very rich, complex issue. Yeah, and I think you're right. And I also think it's not necessarily helpful to think about it as. I mean, the metaphor of emancipation is helpful. I know, I know, I know, I know. It doesn't mean that you have to abandon your family or where you've come from. Yeah. You know, there's often a need for integration. It's, it's, it's really interesting for me. I get a lot of, you know, my channel, as you know, um, I talk a lot about narcissism and more nuanced perspectives on narcissism. And the feedback I get, the most positive feedback I get is often from children of narcissists, grown up children, okay. Okay. because what they say is, I don't want to downplay how difficult and harmful my parents' behavior towards me has been at times. Right. Yeah. However, yeah. they are still my mother or my father and i still love them dearly and they are not evil yeah i, I understand that they I are understand. difficult but there's yeah. but it's like that integration and it's also like well the possibility is there for you to appreciate them for who they are yes and yes. to decide that there are patterns in your relationships that you've seen so far Yes. you do not wish to repeat that you want to do something different and that may require acclimatizing to a new environment you may need to learn some yes. diplomacy skills if you're used to being in a family where everyone just spews out what they think without regard. I know. Or, and, or more often you need to learn some assertiveness skills because you imagine the only way to say what you think is to shout and swear and <laughs> down to say there's other ways of saying things directly so it's it's both i guess you know i almost want to say i think i i accept emancipation as an abstract concept okay mm -hmm. but in actual reality i never dislocated myself from anything okay in other words now the the paradoxically by becoming more located in where i'm from 
that I actually developed to a real, let's say, process of, of um, you could say, abstract emancipation, okay? Because I'm, I'm now, let's say, a better person. Let's say I've, I've developed, okay? But I became developed by becoming more located and more engaged with my circumstances, okay? So now, the, gotta be careful how I say that. That doesn't mean go running to the worst place and go stick yourself in the worst place. I'm saying where I'm from, who I am, my circumstances, involved a lot of toxicity, a lot of unhealth, you know, but I had to start where I'm from. And of course, now be careful in it. That doesn't mean go, go physically be with the worst people, but I mean, accept my situation. Okay. And, and sometimes that means being alone, but I mean, I still carry my situation with me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I still have sort of like, um, you know, I am sort of connected to the constellation of people that are at my level, let's say, even if, even if I have to be careful logistically, how close I am to them, you know, whatever, but I had to, in a sense, become more located and more nestled in where, where I am and who I am to then start the process of actually doing what I never could do, which was take on all the taxation of it. Okay. All, all of the considerations of it because I never knew what welcome was. I never knew what adaptation and conditioning, and I never understood that you can be optimistic about that in the sense that by taking on the, let's say the, the muck and the garbage of it and just taking it on, you can actually transform that into non-garbage. You know what I mean? It's, but that's through the, through the dealing with, you know what I mean? Taking on, taking on and processing. And I really believe that is even a metabolic state actually, because I, I, I really think that almost everything that we do is metabolic. Now I'm, now I'm, I'm saying what I, this is just a theory, but I, I really think that, um, that there's two ways to take, let's say emotions, you know, if you, if you have painful emotions, okay. And you take them on, but if they're not, if they're not welcome towards a process towards an optimistic process, and I'm going to process these things. Okay. If I just, if I, if I take on emotions, but my attitude is not welcome, it, it's just going to degrade me and wear me down. And I think metabolically, that's probably a different process than if we somehow are able to welcome, welcome the, the, the emotional and just the, just the energetic tax, you don't find you know, it. of whatever our situation. You're not at war with it. You're it's like, a, yeah. it and, and that can look different for different people. It's like maybe you accept the grief that this other person in your life is not going to be who you wish they would be. And you start to accept yeah, but the relationship I, as it is and as it can be. That's right. But I, but I think that for me, at least, the, the dichotomy of, of uh, resisting versus open, that wasn't broad enough for me to encompass the, the possibility of welcome. Now, I'm not saying when I say welcome, that doesn't mean that I'm transforming these things into positives. Okay. I'm welcoming the fact that these are problems, that these even could be negatives, but I'm welcoming the dealing with. So I'm not going through that weird thing where I'm starting to paint things nice that are not nice. It's acknowledging how ugly they are, but welcoming that the task to be done. It's sort of like, this is a psychology of your front yard is a disaster, you know? Now, yeah, it's going to be a pain in the ass to get the yard fixed and to get the house fixed. It's going to be a pain in the ass, but somehow acquiring that welcome of knowing that, yeah, it's going to suck for a while, but, but really seeing yourself connected to the end point where it's going to be much better. The house is going to be fixed. The house is going to be nice. The yard is going to be nice. You have to see beyond this, the grueling uh, pain in the ass of the intermediate phase, because you know that you have to start in your life, seeing the actual payoff. You know what I mean? Because I think that that will help us really believe in the, in the welcome, you know what I mean? Because I really believe that without the welcome, I think we're missing some chemical aspect of the metabolism that I think it will not do us well psychologically. You know what I mean? And I really think that um, it's important to have that welcome, that deep welcome, because then you will, will actually start processing and your life can be more of a, of a mechanism for taking garbage and processing it into beautiful things. You know, and I think the, the analogy would be to me like the compost in the garden, you know, the, 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 you know, the biological waste that becomes the healthy soil. You know what I mean? And I think the more we can sort of like see these things in, in life and believe in them in ourselves, I think we can, we can discover like metabolic dimensions 
the the would not would not be even accessible to us through like or the ordinary categories that we see in, in psychology you know the way that the, what i've experienced yeah talk to me and and, and i, I want to say as well that i think both of us are talking in metaphors and that the realities yeah. of people's lives <laughs> i want to say this because i know i know I know, I know that I will get comments. Are you saying that I should stay in an abusive relationship? Are you no, saying no, 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 no. Cut off my abusive parents. And I think these are individual decisions to be made. And yes. sometimes it is absolutely oh, yeah. the right thing to do to remove yourself oh, yeah. from an environment and keep yeah. you safe. Okay, now I, I will say this. Just because I know no, no, what you're I know. saying is misunderstood. Okay, I, I believe I believe that human beings are philosophical beings. Okay. And I believe that to have the complete metabolic fullness of the human experience, I think we do we do need to have the devices of meta, metaphorical understanding as as motivation. Cause I think we, there's aspects of motivation and belief, like justified belief and motivation that we have to have to have the complete um, not just the lack of pathology, but all the the healthy soil that we need, all the vitamins that we need. Oh, so we, there, there is, is made out of shit. <laughs> if you want to I know, but metaphor. but there's the yeah, so so I do believe that we need a certain level of phys- philosophical health and and metaphorical richness, but but out of responsibility. Okay, to anybody who may maybe un- misunderstand what I mean. Let's be very practical now. Let's say if I am a person who is not narcissistic, okay, but if I have been in a couple of relationships that really scared me because I was with people that I love dearly because they had some good qualities, but they were also very narcissistic. And so it was like the Jekyll and Hyde and I felt, and I was even abused and put in danger. You know, if I have any unsettled feelings about that, um, in many cases, in many cases, not, not in every case, because you can't, you can't say for every case, but in many cases, it might be healthy to, to find a way to be single for a while, you know, um, tangibly, tangibly, but in being single and in being physically separate from that person, not to be in the delusion that somehow I don't have deep home identification with the neighborhood of cluster B. Okay. Not necessarily the NPD, but I may in my soul, even though I've gotten myself away and now I'm working on being single, not to fall into that false feeling of, oh, now I'm in the healthy zone. I've gotten rid of all the bad people, but also somehow to explore and see how maybe I have some home identification that, that I have deep identification with, let's say that the neighborhood, the neighborhood of cluster B um, or just the neighborhood of emotional immaturity or things that I can develop, you know? And so that the way I vaccinate myself so that that doesn't happen again as I need to go through some personal development, maybe to become more realistic in life, to get better reality testing. Maybe if, if my life is an, like an, the analogy to like, like a front yard that, that needs to be, you know, like a garden that needs to be tended, tend to my garden, you know, in all the ways that I can, you know what I mean? And try to make myself a more realistic, more resilient person who's really engaged with the world at my level. You know what I mean? Like if, if I have emotional issues, maybe I need to practice maybe taking in information that's not very savory to me. You know, maybe I have an issue, like a lot of people, like I tend to process information better that I, that I feel comfortable with. Maybe I don't process information that I find challenging, you know, so just as an exercise, you know, when dealing with politics, when dealing with issues, maybe try some other points of view just because other points of view are other aspects of my environment that I could be neglecting. You know what I mean? And, and maybe work on maybe doing some, I don't know, like doing some exercise that I don't feel like doing, maybe getting, eating healthier food that even if I prefer to eat nicer tasting food, you know, just kind of doing things to sort of stretch and to take on a little more of the, the, the burden of the, of the, the taxation of life, you know, and, and think of it with that optimism. Like I'm, I'm really processing a better soil by taking on more garbage, let's say, you know what I mean? And so just having that personal, that sense of personal, trying to actualize myself more as a complete person. And then you might find over time that you don't, you don't feel like you've, you've denied your background or you've denied your home identification, but you might find that you now start identifying with other people and sort of connecting with other people at a different level of maturity, you know, expanding. You're expanding. Um, and I think what I'd also suggest to someone in, in that position 
and I and actually for people with NPD as well is that sometimes you need to explore other neighborhoods yeah. and you don't have to explore them by moving there completely so you don't have to get in a, re a romantic relationship that's deeply intimate and committed I would say explore friendships explore you know the relationships you know all of us as humans need multiple relationships and we need community so yes. you know it's not be single and be on your own and be an island and sort your issues out all by yourself it's lean on friends yes if you've got some healthy family members lean on them begin to just expand your repertoire of skills in relating to people yes. and be open to some of the discomforts that it may bring if you're having to relate to people who don't feel like they're from home yes yes you know absolutely. it's like the person yeah. who's grown up in poverty might need to learn how to relate to wealthy people yes and yes. you know i'm not saying anyone's right or anyone's wrong it's a new experience and just to be open to that and like you say the frustrations of that and the the suffering of that and the discomfort welcome it yes. and be open to it and it may expand you and broaden your yeah. relational skills Yes, I can honestly say that one of the things that's helped me the most, and I, I slip all the time, okay? This is not like I have it perfected, but something that has really helped me out a lot is learning how to welcome just garbage feelings that don't feel like they're identifiable. Because a lot of my feelings are so garbage mixed up that I don't even know how to classify them. And I, and I have this anxiety, well, I need to classify how I feel before I can process. Just let things be unclassified. You know, that's another level of dissonance to have unclassified sort of unsorted, un, you know, uncategorizable garbage and just kind of let it be uncomfortable, but, but, but let it, let it be and, and welcome it. And also understand that we don't have to intellectually process anything. Sometimes things can just be within us and we can metabolize them. You know what I mean? And I can say that I like what, I just like what you said about, you know, sort of going to other neighborhoods, because I think a, a very common repetitive neighborhood for people with cluster B issues is this idea of I always have to have a significant romantic partner. That's kind of like the, the re repeat neighborhood. You know, the fact is in, in the environment of all the possibilities of, of the world as it is to me, I, I might be missing a possibility of dealing with something, a real issue for me in life, which is maybe some of my feelings around not being connected to somebody romantically, okay? And that may be an area that has been sort of an untouchable for me, but what that is equivalent to, is like a part of my front yard that I've never dealt with. Let's say a bush that I've just let grow out of control and I've never pruned it, I've never even watered it. It's like, because I don't, I don't go near that bush. That's, that's the one place I don't go because I, 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 I like the other bush. You know, and the idea is that maybe um, it is good as an exercise if, if you're just habitually always in a relationship. It's like, like you said, another neighborhood, another dimension, you know, that it may be um, worth it to sort of take on and welcome. Let's go to that unmentionable place. It's going to suck. It's kind of like I'll say, OK, but I can motivate if, if another person can get over a heroin addiction and how sick they feel. Well, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to try. I'm going to this is going to hurt but I'm going to go ahead and give myself a year and a half where I'm just not going to think about relationships or whatever. It's going to hurt like hell, but you go to that unmentionable place and maybe practice something that I've never dealt with in my whole life. And maybe I'll be discovering in real experience, something that I could never do on the couch, let's say in therapy, which is really talk about how much it hurt me as a young person, feeling like I wasn't attractive feeling like I wasn't selectable, that I wasn't somebody that someone would want to be with, you know, and all those feelings that I could never deal with. It's worth more than just the, the exercise of sitting and trying to remember. How about present, present experience? And you can really, not, not like you're going to figure it out intellectually, but just having that terrible feeling come so you can finally deal with it in the sense of letting it metabolize in a way that I never could as a young person. It's like tolerating it and letting it be without feeling like you got to jump in and fix it. And orchestrate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and control it. And you let it be. And like many of these things, it, it peaks and it will then begin to diminish and it will begin to transform as you're open to it. Yes. And it, but it's a proactive engagement. That's what I'm hearing you say. This is about really engaging with the yeah. world and your experiences. And 
this kind of acceptance is, is really active. It's not a passive process. Yeah. In other words, like, like, I really believe like, you know, I could, I could tell you, I could say that I had an issue as a, as a, as a, let's say as a um, adolescent with that terrible feeling, like I wasn't, I wasn't good looking. I wasn't attractive that I was that kind of person that nobody would ever want to be with, you know, but it, like they say, you know, an experience is worth more words than what I can just talk about is it, it, it's like me talking about playing football is not the same as playing football. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, we, I can talk about it, but now there comes the thing of maybe there has to be a time in my life where I actually re-experience it or get away from that protective series of relationships that I'm using to avoid that place that I, that I don't want to go because maybe it's a place that has, has not been integrated yet, you know, and it deserves to be re really experienced in real time. And maybe I have to go through that because with the optimism, with the philosophy that there is good to be gained by letting that in and knowing that there's a metabolic, you know, and knowing that there is a processing and believing that we can, you know. For you, I'm kind of wondering as well, I don't even know the right word, but what does, I want to say recovery, but I think recovery is the wrong word. I think healing is the wrong word. What does growth and change look like for someone with NPD? Well, I mean, the problem, I'm, I'm going to tell you why I'm cautious about this. Okay. Because I see this as an issue. I think the problem that I had as a person with NPD was that I was not raised and I did not have any experience to allow me any expectation of what it would, I, I didn't have a meaningful expectation of what it would mean to be a healthy person. I could see the results in people. I can see, oh, look at those people I used to fly with when I was in my twenties. Now they're FedEx captains and they're flying wide body captains and they've got these million dollar houses and they live on Lake Tahoe. And, you know, they're like these, and I can see that. Okay. But that doesn't mean because I can see the results of success. That doesn't mean that I know what success feels like. You see, I don't have any way of knowing because I've never been, let's say, six, really healthy. You know what I mean? So when you look at it through the eyes of envy, you don't have the resources to know, have any expectations of what it would really take to really be that way, you know, or even somewhat like that. So I think, you know, there has to be a place where someone with NPD can come to at least the possibility that their set of expectations may not even correspond at all to what it means to be a healthy person. Okay. So there has to be a place where you come, where you, you at least question whether you even have any idea what it would be like to be healthy. Okay. Even when you see you like, Oh, you yeah, know, intellectually, I should be more engaged in the world. I should be more uh, taking on of the taxes of the world and, and the feelings. Yeah, 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 yeah. But stop for a second and think I said that, but that's like me watching a football game and I'm watching these, these premier league players, you know, doing their thing. Do I really know what it's like to be on the field, getting bumped around and running at high speed? And, and the, you know, I have no idea because it watching it and thinking about it is nothing like the actual, you know? So I think the problem I see, the barrier I see to people with cluster B is where you get the buy-in, where you get the purchase, where they, where they buy in truly understanding that, there is another level of engagement that they probably can't even imagine so that it's almost useless to try to try to um, project yourself ahead and sort of get rid of the anticipatory psychology and actually make the decision to start simply engaging without knowing what it's going to look like, you see. And I think for a lot of people, that's a lot to ask for. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I think because you have to get that motivation. And so I think that's where... Um, if I see, let's say, a frontier in therapy and psychology, it's sort of helping motivate people to go to places that they couldn't imagine, okay? And there is a type of motivation for that. I've seen that done with certain people. Like I've seen, you know, really good, uh, like authors of books, they sort of pre present things in a way where you, you almost think like, God, I could not imagine that, but they're, they're, actually, they're actually motivating me to, to sort of try it, you know what I mean? And so I think it's almost like a, a philosophical thing where, you know, to sort of maybe before directly proposing to someone with cluster B, just sort of meditating on how we as people often cannot imagine things that we haven't actually experienced, you know, and sort of slowly 
kind of selling it, almost selling it to people, the idea that there could be a whole world of possibilities that you've never known. And the only way to know is to start trying new things. But I think I've found when I deal with people that I identify as having cluster B adjacent or cluster B issues, I find sometimes it's very challenging to motivate them towards things that are sort of unknown or sort of unfamiliar. That can be very difficult. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But I like the metaphor. There is a sort of need sometimes to take a leap yeah. into the unknown. And, and I also think inherent in cluster B thinking is very black and white. And oh, I think yeah. it should be really clear that that recovery, whatever it is, isn't yeah. this sort of, well, I was in a toxic state and now I am healthy. It's like, oh gosh, like yeah. nobody, nobody is that black and white. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. you know, health involves an element of struggle. It, it involves yeah. weighing things up. It involves deciding what's important to you. It involves sacrifices. It involves discomfort. It involves frustrations and failures. And yeah. that's part of being human. And that's part of life. Yeah. And yeah. you have to welcome all of that. It's not a once I was lost and now I am found kind of situation. Know. You know, it, it, that's not how it is. It's not real. Well, I guess if if I were to try, if I were to try, and I and I guess I I want to try. I want to try. If I were to try to try to sell this to somebody with with real NPD who really believes they have NPD or any, anything in the cluster B neighborhood, you know, I would say that it is my belief, my belief, and I and I I just propose it. You know, it's my belief that a lot can be gained, a lot can be gained with a welcoming attitude towards, towards unfamiliar burdens, wh whatever that may be. Okay. I remember the feeling I had as a child, I was traumatized by hot peppers, like jalapeno peppers, you know, spicy peppers. I, I, I had an accident where I picked a pepper off a bush when I was like three years old and I just put it in my mouth and I burned my mouth so bad. It was like a, like a trauma, you know? And then when I was six years old, uh, I, a friend of my father's, he used to eat jalapenos with peanut butter. And I, I tried a jalapeno and I just cried my eyes out. But it, there finally came a point. I don't know how this happened, but I thought, you know what? This is a challenge, you know? And when I was like 13 or 14 years old, I tried to slowly start eating hot peppers. It was very hard for me because I, I, I had everything against me, you know, to want to do that. But something told me that it was just like a, it was like a challenge, you know, it's like a challenge. And I guess it's like a flicker of inspiration that I can't even explain, but you know, um, other people, like I can't eat fish, like fish, don't give me a fish, don't give me a fish that has bones, you know, but it, I almost think like, if, if, if I were to try to sell this to some of the MPD, I would say, you know, do a couple of things, you know, even if you don't want to do it, have a garden, have a compost, have compost, because compost is such a metaphor. It's a metaphor so deep that even if you don't know how deep it is, just having your compost will get inside of you just without you analyzing it, you know, and knowing that you put garbage, you put all your waste, all your waste products, put it in the compost, you know, and then don't even try to analyze it, but have that, have exercise and then eat fish with bones. You know what I mean? And however gross that is, try to have the belief that it's not bad for you and think of it as like a, like a mountain to conquer. And then in life, try to do analogies to those things, you know, welcoming in and believing that it makes you better, you know, without really maybe understanding, you know, but I think there has to be an initial motivation that comes from a place of, of infected faith, where you sort of infect the person with the faith and the belief. So it is it really is faith and belief, because even though the psychologist might understand the person with NPD, you might as well be talking about the resurrection, because for them... <laughs> Well, no, for them, it's completely unreal. You see what I mean? So it's like you, you have to almost sell something on pure faith and belief. And that I think that is a challenge, but I think it's worth exploring, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I, it's interesting as well. Sometimes what the reluctance is to try, it can be a reluctance to stick with a job, stick with a career. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, it can be a reluctance to engage in relationships with people who are not fitting the cluster B flavor. Yes, and, yes. and I say relationships plural, because I, I think that equally applies to friendships and relationships uh, in the workplace and, and relationships within family, you know, depending on who's in your family. But it's like, 
allowing those things in. Yeah. And, and there it has to be. Possible. Yeah, I think that there's like a transition period because you have to transition to this, you know, slowly, slowly, you have to get to a point where you actually become habitually welcome of the ugly and the nasty and the, the distasteful, knowing that it's the fuel that gets you to a better place. But you get there slowly, like you have to almost believe on the way that you will eventually get to a place where you really start to welcome whatever is assorted and, and you know, sort of incompatible and, and dissonant and ugly and messed up so that you, you finally realize that the compost metaphor has now become real in yourself and you are now a compost bin. Give me all the garbage, you know, I mean. I, I don't mean, I mean, to, to a point, you know, to where you really welcome things that are just seem incompatible, incongruous, that this is not for me. And, you know, it doesn't become indiscriminate, but you just become more able to, you know, become the compost bin, I guess. And I, I, I don't know how, how to stress this, but I really think that along with all the motivation, I think it would really have almost shamanic uh, value for people to really dedicate themselves, however much they don't want to, to a compost um, experiment in their house. You know, like a, I don't know how, some people have apartments, so you'd have to be very creative, but to actually have in your, in your dominion, the actual process of garbage being converted into soil. I think, uh, I think that that metaphor is so powerful that just talking about it doesn't possibly uh, capture mm -hmm. how much it really, uh, and also to think that the human, the word human, the word human is similar to the word humus. It actually means from soil. You know what I mean? I mean, it's so deep in our identity, you know, what we are, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just something to think about, but, you know, but I, I, I do, I do think that um, I don't, I don't see, I, I don't see the, the process of therapy and healing as complete without the ability to inspire people towards things at the level of belief and faith at that, in that sense, because you, you really have to respect that for a lot of people, this is completely unknown. It's unreal. It's, it's like, I'm going to take you out of your country. I'm going to put you somewhere. You don't speak the language. You don't understand the customs. Yeah. <laughs> no idea what's going on around you, but trust yeah. me, you're going to love it. Well, you know, nowadays, because we're sort of in the post the post-religious phase of modernity, you know what I mean? Like, or post-modernity, whatever. It's not really like um, a real current skill that a lot of people have to sort of do the job of like the evangelist, you know what I mean? Like, like selling the, the mystical, you know, selling, selling belief in, in things that are unknown. You know what I mean? I think that the, the, the evangelic arts are kind of um, not, not really, I don't know. I don't know the, I don't know where you really find, I don't know that that's really an up to date. That's not a skill that's really present today. You know, I think we should like bring back. Evangelism or, or maybe, or yeah, or maybe, maybe, maybe have it emerge appropriate to today's reality. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's not like a reversion to a past uh, naivete, but you know. But I also think as, as human beings, there is both within all of us, there is both. Yeah. The sort of urge to stay at home with the familiar and the comfortable yes yes and there is also the drive to explore yeah the unknown but it's a kind of like you've which, which way you're going to go and i think some of us are more driven to stay home and some of us yes. are more driven to explore yes um yes. but it's like to find the sort of exploration and there's um you know i i kind of think there's there's a beautiful poem i love it which, which talks about it's called sweet darkness. Okay. And it kind of, oh, I can't remember the words, but I'm going to look it up because it's so nice. <laughs> He's, it's, it's such a lovely poem. I, I came across it actually when I was going through a breakup. Wow. And it was a really nice poem. If I can find it. Yeah, it's really lovely. Because he talks about when, when your eyes are tired, the world is tired also. And he's too, he's, I think he's really talking about as you engage, that is how the world is going to be to you. Yes. Yeah. And then he talks about when your vision has gone, no part of the world can find you. And I think that's yeah. true. I think you see that. Yeah. If you can only see the world through one lens, yeah. and yeah. it's a time to go into the dark where the night has eyes to recognize its own. And I love this line. 
the dark will be your home. Wow. That's really, the that's night. really, that's really, yeah. This is good. The night will give you a horizon further than you can see. Yeah, that's like, beautiful. Embrace the darkness and then yes. you get to go a little further. Yes. And I think maybe, maybe for the people who are working in the area of therapists, like say therapists, mm -hmm. Even though it can be so hard to inspire and motivate, and I also I don't know this the traditional job of therapists to inspire or motivate. I have to I have to admit that. Okay. Um, I think the only way to motivate someone in faith is to have faith. You know what I mean? And I think that part of the faith of the motivator, the motivator, is to have the faith that deep down inside of everybody is the budding tiny little seed that can actually accept the faith. You know what I mean? And so even though I may just be the tiniest grain to know that there is somewhere in anybody, the, the, the part of them that could buy into the motivation, you know, I think the where did seeds germinate in the soil, <laughs> in the dark. Oh yeah. Hey, no, that's really, that's really neat. Let's yeah. See. I really appreciate that. Let's see, yeah. Here we go. We, we've entered the realm of poetry and metaphor. Yeah. But I think that's right. Well, I think that, that there's, there's much more in arts and literature sometimes than you can get to through kind of science and therapy. Yeah. And, and in the end, that we will have to eventually live it and not just talk about it, you know, and, and that, it, that living it is conditioning. So, you know, I just, I just leave all that. It's a big challenge. It's like, you know, but we can all be maybe much more than we think. And actualization is kind of like, you know, you'll feel more and more in life like a mountain climber or a real adventurer because life is a really a sport, you know, I'm, or even more, you know, so. Yeah, but I, I love that metaphor too, because the more you condition yourself and the more you recondition yourself, the stronger you become. And where maybe you can only walk a mile, if you keep hey. going, then maybe you can run a marathon. You know, if you if you do it 300 days out of the year, even if you even if you advance just a few meters a day, that will add up over time. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and it's it's the kind of compounded gains. It's like just get one yeah. percent better each time. It's it, it's it gives you a lot more than you might expect. That's all I can say. You know, and I I see I, I say that believing it. You know. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'd really love to talk more, maybe not now, but another time about what is this, what is recovery? What is, I and, I, and I, I, I think the words fail us, but what is the unknown and what, what do you find? I'll, 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 I'll make you a never point. arrive. You never really arrive. Yeah. Anyone says they're, they've arrived. I've, I've, I'm self-actualized. No, it's, it's, it's tough but it, it's tough in a good way i i will make a point of really thinking about that because i because I, I i will i will make it a point to really think about that yeah i'd love to talk more about that yeah 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 thank you so much all right anything else you want to say or should we leave it there no i just i really appreciate what you're doing i really appreciate what you're doing because i feel like um some people really have i don't know call it, they, they have like the they have the calling, I guess the calling, because I think deep down inside, I think, you know, there's a lot that can be done. I think I, I, that, that can only explain your motivation. You know what I mean? That you must really believe something deep, that there's a lot more possible than what we realize, you know, presently. Oh, and so, yeah, I, I sense, at least I get the feeling like you really, you really expect that a lot more than what currently we, we think is possible may, may be possible, but you know, and I, and I really appreciate that you're, you, that you've been willing to, um, you know, um, address something as difficult and with such a bad reputation as NPD. I, I really appreciate that. No, thank you. Yeah.